In this video, we will explore the Bohr model. We'll be discussing what it is, how the flame test and AES provides evidence for the Bohr model, and looking at how we can figure out the electron configurations of different atoms using the Bohr model. Here are our relevant syllabus dot points. The Bohr model is an updated improvement from the Rutherford model. If we remember in the Rutherford model, the electrons are simply orbiting the positive nucleus. But a problem with that model is that according to classical physics, the electrons should lose energy and crash into the nucleus. The Bohr model aims to overcome this issue with the introduction of the idea of quantized shells. The idea of quantized shells is that electrons in each of the shells have a particular amount of energy which is required for them to be at that level, a particular discrete amount of energy. So for example, if we have the shell n equals to 1, maybe there might be a particular amount of energy, say x, that is required for an electron to be in that orbit. To be in n equals 2, maybe it needs a bit more energy than x, and n equals to 3 may be a certain amount more than that too. Now electrons can either be described as being in the ground state or in the excited state. Electrons which are in the ground state are in their lowest possible energy states. So for example, if an electron was in shell 1, its ground state might be 1. If an electron naturally exists in n equals to 2, n equals to 2 would be its ground state. The excited state, however, describes an electron which has gained energy which allows them to move to a higher energy level. Because each of the shells themselves have discrete energy levels, for an electron that naturally exists in n equals 1, in order for it to go up to n equals 2, it must gain energy equal to the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2. Once it has moved up to 2 and has been promoted to a high energy level, we then call this electron an excited state electron. One of the ideas of the Bohr model is about the emission of light, which we'll go into more detail in the next sections. So according to the Bohr model, because each shell is quantized, just as an electron requires energy gain in order to go from this one to this level, the same is required for it to go backwards. It must release the energy. So going from n equals to 3 to n equals to 2, a certain photon of a particular wavelength must be released. The flame test is an analytical technique which we use to identify the ions of multiple different metals. The way that it works is a solution containing different metal ions becomes vaporized in a flame and we get each of these different colors appearing for the different metals which are in the solution. It's important to note, however, that we cannot use the flame test for all metals. Here's a table which shows the different colors produced by some of the metal ions. Barium is going to give us this apple green color. Strontium will give us scarlet. Lithium will give us crimson. Sodium will give us this orange yellow color. Copper will give us blue green. And potassium will give us this lilac color. AES, also known as Atomic Emission Spectroscopy, is another analytical technique whereby we create things called spectra in order to identify gas molecules. The principle of this is that we excite electrons in example of gas through heating. So in this diagram we have a hydrogen gas tube which produces light. This light is then passed through a lens to magnify it, passed through a narrow slit, and then refracted through a prism to split the light into its multiple different wavelengths. These slits can then be shown onto a dark background in order for us to produce these spectral lines which we can see here. Here are the different spectra which are produced by hydrogen, neon and beryllium. Notice that the spectra are unique for each element. AES is particularly important because it provides us evidence for the Bohr model. As we expect from the Bohr model, the drop in electron levels from a high energy state to a lower energy state is going to release a photon producing different colors depending on what their wavelengths are. The light which is produced in the spectra provide evidence for this postulation in which the uniqueness of each of the different element spectra demonstrates the many different electron states that are in the gas. The electron configuration of an atom is the arrangement of the electrons in the shells. Electron shells fill in particular orders, with the first shell containing two electrons, 
the second shell containing 8, the third containing 18, the fourth 32, and the fifth shell 50. These numbers will have to be memorized. Here's an important term that we'll have to learn. The outer shell of an atom is called the valence shell. And the electrons which are on the valence shell are called the valence electrons. Remember from our previous slide that we said that the first shell holds two electrons. Here are two electrons here, one and two in the first shell. There are eight in the second shell, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And there is a maximum of 18 electrons in the third shell. Well, we see that there are only eight electrons here. So the third shell will be able to fill in an additional 10 electrons if there were more available. We'll briefly talk about the octet rule. The octet rule is a rule which states that elements aim to have eight valence electrons in the outer shell. This means that they have a general full outer shell. Elements which have eight valence electrons are inert or non-reactive. And this is desirable because it means that they are highly stable. Group 18 elements such as neon and argon all have eight valence electrons and are all inert. We call this group of elements the noble gases. When we are figuring out the electron configurations of different atoms, there are three particular rules with... The first is that each shell can only contain its maximum amount of electrons. This means that there cannot be more than two electrons in shell one, eight in shell two, or 18 in shell three, and etc. The second one is that lower energy shells will fill first. This means that the first electron shell will fill first, then the second, then the third. Rule number three slightly breaks this. The last one is quite important because it somewhat is an exception to rule two. It says that before the third shell fills up to 18, it will stop at eight, add two more electrons to shell four, and then it'll continue to fill up shell three. And we'll look at some examples in the next slide talking about how this works. Here we have three different elements for which we'll demonstrate the electron configurations. The number of electrons which an element has should just be equal to the number of protons it has in elemental form. So it'll just be the number which is on the periodic table. Let's take our first example, oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight, which means that it has eight protons and eight electrons in its elemental form. We need to arrange the eight electrons around its nucleus to determine its electron configuration. The first shell has two electrons, one, two, meaning that we have a remaining six out of the eight electrons to fill up. If we remember from rule two, the lower shells will fill up first, so we cannot fill up one here and then the second one over here. After this first shell has been filled, we then continue to fill up the second shell. So the third one goes here, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And this is the electron configuration completed for oxygen. Another example is sodium. Sodium has 11 electrons, so we add two into the first shell, like so, one, two, meaning that we have now nine remaining. We then fill up the second shell. We have th third one, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we added a total of eight electrons into the second shell, which maximizes it. Now, as I said earlier, sodium has 11 electrons, which means that we have one more electron remaining, and we add that into the third shell, 11. Fe is a transition metal, which has 26 electrons. We'll be able to notice how we can use rule three by doing this electron configuration. So as usual, we'll start off with the first shell. We have one, two electrons here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Then we'll move on to the third shell and we'll fill up eight more. So 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. 
Now, if we remember, rule 3 said after we fill up 8 electrons in shell 3, we continue on to shell 4, and we fill up 2. So the 19th electron will go here, and the 20th electron will go here. Now that we've added 2 electrons into the final 4th shell, we can then go back to shell 3 to continue filling it up. So we have 26 electrons, and we have 6 electrons remaining after we've used 20. So here will be 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. Here we'll do an example question. So the question asks us to draw the electron configuration of calcium using the Bohr model. Now grab your periodic tables, and what you'll notice is that calcium is in the fourth period. Since it's in the fourth period, this must mean that it is going to have four electron shells for us to draw. So we have the nucleus here, we have the first shell, the second shell, the third shell, and the fourth shell. So we'll go CA here. The first shell has two electrons and calcium has 20, so we put in one, two. Calcium now has 18 remaining electrons. So then we fill up the second shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've used 10 electrons now and we have another 10 electrons remaining. So we fill up the next eight in shell three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And remember from rule three, we need to move on to the next one, onto shell four first to add two more before we can go back onto shell three. But now we've used up all 20 electrons and this is going to be the electron configuration for calcium.